Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 4 of Famous Fans on the Copy Podcast. I'm Mick Moran and I'm absolutely made up to say that I'm joined by what I would consider a living legend, a comedian and massive Liverpool fan, Alex Horn. Alex, thanks so much for, for taking the time to jump on. Pleasure, Mick. I mean, I don't think anyone's described me as a living legend before, um, <laughs> but I'll take it. I like it. I'm definitely living. <laughs> and I, I am a massive Liverpool fan. Um but it took me a while to admit that because, you know, once you put your head above the parapet and if you're vaguely in the public eye, then you're a, every time they lose, you get a message. And every t- Anyway, yeah. but yes, it's true. So here I am. Hello, mate. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it only t- it took me to get to read the Liverpool website where you've done that interview to, for kind of my two worlds to collide, like Taskmaster and Liverpool. Then I was like. Alex is a Liverpool fan. I was like, this is this is incredible. And I, that's when I that's when I reached out to you to, to jump on the podcast. So thanks for, so much for jumping on. That's a pleasure. It's funny, isn't it? Because you should be more proud. But equally, I don't talk about politics ever on Twitter. I'd never say anything. I never really express an opinion because it's just people yeah. pile on. And football sort of right up there. If people know you're a red, then you're just it's it's an open goal for everyone else. So anyway. This is so it's a big deal for me too, Mick. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. But I just thought we'd literally just start at the very beginning. Then, obviously, how how you became a Liverpool fan? How did that how did that happen? Well, so I'm one of three boys, and I've actually got three boys of my own now, who are who are nine, eleven, and twelve. And my kids are all Liverpool fans, but my dad was a Tottenham fan, and uh, for fair enough reasons. So he. He used to spend some time living around there. Uh, but he didn't make any of us Tottenham fans. And part of me wishes he did because, you know, we'd all support the same team. But we lived near, between Portsmouth and Brighton, but not close enough to either team for them to be a proper local team. We're about 45 minutes from each. My older brother started supporting Man United. I don't know who I supported, but it was never going to be Man United or Tottenham. But my little brother looked a lot like Sammy Lee. So he started supporting uh, Liverpool. And then one morning decided he wasn't going to, so I jumped on. And this was probably 1984, so it was good timing. They were already, you know, the best team, but before yeah. they'd done the double that time round. So I, I don't know why I leapt on. My little brother was four at the time, so so I was five or six, and just stuck with it because they were clearly. <laughs> it was a good time to be a Liverpool fan. So <laughs> yeah, so that was it. So it's not. It was just because uh, they wore red. My brother was a Man U fan. My little brother was an Everton fan. So it's no, there's no logic, except that once you're in, you're in. And no, none of us have changed since then. Although the Everton fan has given up football, understandably. But the Man U fan had decades of crowing over me. And now we're sort of back to level. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, there's the, the over recent years where they haven't won anything and they've been really, really terrible. Yeah. It's been nice, yeah. hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I still I think we need years and years of this to make up for it. Yeah, well, my my whole childhood was basically I was born eighty nine, so I didn't get to see a title win until recently. So I've been rubbing it in anyone's faces as, as much as I can when I can. Yeah, um, fair enough, fair enough. How did you <laughs> how did you feel last year when, yeah. when they finally won? Was it were there tears? Oh, two there, years. There, there two was years. a little bit actually. No, yeah, two years now, isn't it? I suppose officially. it was two years. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. I, th- I mean, I think it was like a, there was like a huge pour outpouring of emotion, wasn't it, from. I mean, especially for someone like me who hasn't seen. Obviously, you were born in '78, so you had those those 80 years to kind of get get, get your buy up until obviously '89, where when, when we stopped winning the, the league title, but we obviously still did win some stuff in between that time. Notably, 2005 Champions League and FA Cups and whatever else. But yeah, I think it. I think there was a few tears. I think it was just kind of like an outpouring of emotion from all those like like we've just been talking about the, the man united era where they dominated dominated so much and having to play second fiddle to them so it was nice to to have our time i think yeah yeah especially with the threat of the season being cancelled but my so my eldest boy is 11 and i was 11 last time they won the league so yeah i'd had from 11 to 43 to wait and i think my kids are just spoiled and same with england as well you know they they, they see england every tournament getting far in and they see Liverpool competing everywhere, you know, being world club champions. So yeah, I don't know what's right. I, part of me wishes I supported a middle of the road team. So I, I live near Wick and Wanderers and they're a nice family club. So we go and watch them, but Chesham United is my second team. So, so we walk to Chesham and we watch them and, and the kids play for their junior teams. 
but you can't be a full time Chesham fan. <laughs> <laughs> Not when you've you know when the Champions League on. So um yeah. Yeah, I think that's it, it. I mean, it's it's nice to be supporting a team that's in the Champions League, isn't it? Obviously, supporting your local teams is nice and that. But when when the when the big games come around, you want to be you want to be involved in them, don't you? I suppose you want to be involved. You do. Yeah, I mean, if Liverpool, our dream as Chesham fans, there's a few of us Liverpool Chesham fans, and they they got through to the third round of the FA Cup a few years ago. I've got a picture up there. They they beat Bristol City. Uh, you can't really see it, but anyway, but they yeah, beat yeah, Bristol yeah. City. And then they played uh, Bradford, and we all had this dream that they would beat Bradford and then get drawn against Liverpool. And that would be—that's what I really want. That's that's my ultimate fixture. I think Liverpool coming to Chesham. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, I think just yeah, I, I, I'm I'm right behind that. Just just so you could fulfil that that yeah. mini mini dream. <laughs> it's possible. The seventh the seventh tier. You know, it's possible one day. Yeah, I hope it happens just so just so that that's fulfilled for you. But uh, in terms of like like idols growing up, then obviously you're born in '78, so those '80s years were probably quite formative in terms of John Barnes mm-hmm. and Ian Rushes and whoever else. But do you think those two would be the the top two for you? Uh, well, it should be Barnes, but for me, it was Rush all the way. Uh, it was the goal in the FA Cup final against Everton when he knocked over the camera in the corner of the net. That's you know because in those days everyone watched the FA Cup final together all for, all the family you know my mum would watch it even though she didn't like football and so it was rush and then it was john aldridge as well because he i don't know you know he, he looked the same as rush <laughs> and then it was craig johnston because of the predator well no it was obviously before that but then the predator boot documentary did you is this familiar to you we just yeah. vaguely remember it yeah so he designed yeah. the football boot which really sort of <laughs> meant he was a legend to me and also the fact that he's Australian there, there were no Australian footballers back then and then Grobelar as well Bruce Grobelar was a character I think you liked the characters and I think it felt like there were more yeah. characters so Jan Mulby as well because he was such a unit in the middle Yeah, but they're all you know back then you could name the 11 and there weren't really anyone else so you know Ray Houghton and Ronnie Whelan and people like that I don't think they were glamorous players um, Ronnie Rosenthal I really like because he was from Israel and that was hilarious so, so pretty much all, any of them uh, yeah. Hanson my, my aunt really fancied Alan Hanson I remember that but they were all legends I think back then and I don't know if that's because we watched football as kids and so those are the memories you make but it felt like that team were just chock full of characters and brilliant players yeah, I think football's come on so much, hasn't it? Like now, it's like sports science, and you, everyone's eating right, drinking right, and the more the athletes now. Whereas back then, they were on the on the lash on a Friday night, drinking ten pints, and like you said, the the squads were smaller as well, so the, the, there was more characters in there because there was maybe a twelve, thirteen players who were actually picked for the season rather than like the eighteen, nineteen, maybe that there is now. Yeah, exactly. And I have been lucky enough; I've met a few. of a few footballers recently, because we've done this show with Peter Crouch, who I imagine we might come on to, because um, it feels like every club he's played for, people like him. I think yeah. the Liverpool fans think he's one of their own, but so do most of the clubs he's played for, and he's played for a lot of clubs. But we had John Barnes on that, and that was really surreal. I've met quite a few famous people, but he was one of the few people I've been starstruck with. And he does not like... Yeah, he gives the impression that he still parties and lives... A colourful life. He doesn't hold back. Yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, I've I've met Barnsley a few times, obviously, like outside Anfield or whatever. But the one it was like Ruddock was outside the ground, like for the Burnley game this year, like selling corn pies. I just remember <laughs> thinking, this is just so random, but like so great at the same yeah. time. Oh, I loved Ruddock when he played for us as well. Because he, he came from Tottenham, and my, so I watched him. I I tended to go and watch Tottenham with my dad. Um, we went to Anfield. My first game was watching them play Coventry in about, I don't know, uh, very early 90s. But I, my first memory of watching them live was at White Hart Lane and they lost to Tottenham and I cried in the Tottenham fans. It was horrible. <laughs> Still really stays with you, that. Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, when, when you're that age as well, especially, that's that's something that you just can't, you, you always want your team to do well, don't you? So especially if you're in... In their ground, in their backyard, yeah. that, that's that hurts even more, doesn't it? And it's your it's first been... game. You've gone there as a ten-year-old, and you remember that bit walking through the, you know, to your seats where you see the ground for the, the the grass for the first time, 
and then it's just crushed. And it so often happens in football. It's such a big day. If I don't get to go to many live games, it's such a big build-up where you take your kids, and then they don't they lose. And it's such a stupid hobby. <laughs> it's such a stupid thing to do with our lives, but you can't throw it away. One of my good friends is a guy called Tim Key, who used to be a Liverpool fan, and he's managed to wean himself off, which I, you know, again, sort of wish I had been able to do, but instead I've gone further in with the kids. But my my in laws are all from Northern Ireland, and they're all Liverpool fans. So, um, you know, so you can't you can't get out. There, yeah, <laughs> but you mentioned there, obviously. Um, some Spurs fans. You said your dad was a, a Spurs fan as well. So that that 2019 um, final must have been quite interesting, was it? Yeah. Well, first of all, it was my wife's 40th birthday party, which, you know, when you book something like that, and then you realise it's the Champions League final. We booked it maybe four months before, and you think, well, we might make the final. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then it felt inevitable we would after that, despite, the you know, the 3-0 Barcelona half halfway scoreline but um yeah so the night itself we had my wife's party so we she was very good and she let us have a big screen up in one room and there's a few Tottenham fans there as well but it was one of those nights because it was the early goal it was sort of a reasonably relaxing final for me I, I kind of I, I wasn't able to be glued to it because it was my wife, my wife's birthday but as soon as the early goal went in I I, I was able to I just had a good feeling yeah. And I think Tottenham fans didn't. And I think if Tottenham had won that, they, they would be in a different place to where they are now. I'm sure they will think that too. It's a huge result for them not winning. And I think, uh, I just think we've, we've so got the edge in Europe because of our history, I think. Um, and we're used to losing, you know, that. so the one before was my kids' first experience of us losing a big match. Not that we, we were there, but we all we all got together to watch that final and it was uh that was quite sickening but it meant everyone toughened up a thing for the Tottenham match yeah I, think like, yeah I mean that was that was the thing wasn't it we kind of went into that game the Spurs game thinking we've done this the year before and we lost so we do everything we can to not let that happen again and I think like you said the game wasn't great it was one probably it's, it's never going to make a DVD that final it was really really bad and I mean I think the early goal kind of ruined it in a way but I was kind of glad that we got that early goal because then we had something to sit back on but, yeah, and who cares? Yeah, who cares what the game was, like? especially because the run to it was so good. So, yeah, no, I just uh, uh, it's funny though. I did I get on I get on really well with my dad, and we don't we're not the sort of family. We're a bit pathetic. We don't phone each other up when there's so when Liverpool beat Man U this season five nil. I didn't. We don't need to phone each other up because we know I know how he's feeling. Yeah. So I felt sorry for my dad because he he watched he was behind the goal when Tottenham won the I think the Cup Winners Cup you know whenever that was probably Pat Jennings maybe I don't know when it was so he's you know I don't think he sees Tottenham getting in that many more European finals yeah so I didn't want them to win but if they had there would have been a tiny bit of me pleased for my dad I suppose. Yeah, I suppose that's a good thing to have, isn't it? I suppose if you've got someone close to you who's the rival fan, then you can kind of go, well, I'm devastated we lost, but at least you get to be happy in a way. Yeah. You know, you don't want it to be the case, but yeah. Yeah, and he was quite begrudgingly polite about it, you know, because <laughs> it's miserable. It's miserable, it's the worst. <laughs> But obviously then, so we touched on the 2019, but I believe you were also in Istanbul for 2000, 2005. How, how was that? Oh, um, Even you saying that sends shivers down your spine. It's the one thing in my life, you know, that you think about it. I, I, can, send, I can make myself get goosebumps by thinking about it. So what happened was, so I got married that year, and my wife tells me off a lot because that's the, the game was obviously the best day of that year <laughs> by miles. So my brother-in-law had two tickets, and my new father-in-law kindly and you know the wrong decision gave me his ticket so we went out and stayed the night before didn't get any sleep and then the game was obviously ridiculous and that is the dvd you know we've got the dvd of that and the run to that was amazing actually the olympiacos match was on my stag night and we went tenth and bowling and i remember gerard's goal then was it mccoy's character uh, mccoy's commentary i think um, I can't remember the exact Andy phrase. Gray, was it? Oh, it was Andy Gray, was it? Yeah. Andy Gray, yeah. 
so I don't remember it that well. But you know that goal, <laughs> I was quite oh, Scottish. Well. Yeah, exactly. But seeing that fly in, and then yeah, just Istanbul. I don't, I'd not experienced an away European match and the sea of people, you know, in every bar, everyone hanging out of it and just singing constantly, and it was just ridiculous. I think I saw what's his name, Colin Murray, outside with a microphone. And I remember seeing, noticing his tattoo. He's got he's got tattoos, I think, of the stars. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I just the whole thing was a dream. And then obviously at half time, we did see people near us, chuck the tickets away and left. And when you watch the final, there's I can see there's this old guy in the crowd who's near us. I can't see me in it, but I promise I was there. I've got the little they handed out little um, headbands with the with sort of red red hair on it, and I've got my ticket framed. But it does feel like you're that person saying I was there. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. And then no one slept. And then we flew, flew back that day. And I got back to London and I got the, the wrong train twice to where back to where I was living. Because, it, you know, it was... And I was wearing a Liverpool top and everyone stopped you and said, I can't believe you were there and all that. And it was, yeah, it was just a dream. And even if they would not won another match after that, I think I'd have been, I'd have been all right. Yeah, well, I think we were dining out, dining out on that. Champions League went for a long time as Liverpool fans off. Obviously, up until we just talked about the the champ the recent Champions League win and the Premier League win, yeah, we didn't have that much in between. Obviously, there was a few here and there, but we didn't get the any of the of the big ones up until then. So, I, mean, I guess fourteen years is quite a big gap for someone to win a Champions League for a club the size of Liverpool, isn't it? So that was so. In terms of you getting lost, then was that because you you'd had too much to drink or on, on your, your just, train? You though? just replayed it over and over in your head. It was like so. I got married earlier that year, and my wife and I, when we, when you go on the honeymoon, you sort of replay the day. But it was more than that for, for the football because because it was all so unlikely to have happened. And even when they were three all, Shevchenko should have scored that header. No yeah. idea how it didn't go in. And then the penalty shootout can go either way. So you're just buzzing. You know, it's so much emotions and it was so raw. And at halftime, I did get a lot of texts from people saying, because it was expensive to go, obviously. Yeah. And I do, hats off to proper fans. I need to make it clear, I'm not a proper fan, but proper fans who go to all those games and spend all that money. And most of the time, you don't win the Champions League. So, you know, it was, it was just raw. And you've shouted for 48 hours at that point. So it was just brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I was fifteen at the time, so I think I was just I was just sat in my bedroom. It wasn't anything as glamorous as what you were seeing. I was just sat in my room with a cup of tea, probably a few biscuits. But what was funny, it wasn't glamorous either because it, I mean, it was incredible, but it was so weirdly organised. You, you, we all had to get coaches out to the Ataturk. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of Atatürk, and that, but it took hours and hours, and you were stranded for ages, and then getting back into it after as well. We were stuck in the stadium for. It felt like a couple of hours. So it was sort of really long. And if you'd lost, it would have been horrendous. But we just, you know, you want, you never wanted to leave the stadium. And the players all came over and it felt like they were... It felt, without sounding sentimental, it did feel like the players were supporters as well. Because you've got Gerard and Carragher. Yeah. Carragher was still there, was he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, phew. I don't want to say something that's completely <laughs> factually incorrect. Um, yeah, it felt like... They couldn't believe it either, I suppose. Yeah. And because it wasn't the greatest team. It was like when we played Barcelona in the second leg and didn't have our greatest team. You know, that that was such an unlikely win, I think, because Origi was our hero. And, you know, obviously Gerard won it for us and Alonso was still brilliant. But it wasn't a great team on paper, I don't think. Yeah, we should. We, we, we had no right, really. The, the team that they had with, like, Cafu and Maldini and Seedorf and Catuso. It was just, just yeah. like, like you said before, with the old Liverpool teams, it was like an all star team. That that AC Milan team was kind of similar to that in a way. That was like an all star eleven that we had no right to to beat. That was kind of why yeah. it made it so so good. And the following year, it was kind of inevitable, but it didn't it didn't really matter so much. Although it did seem, it I don't know, it felt like we were definitely going to win that either. To me. Uh, sorry, it felt to me like we were definitely going to win that as well, just because it felt like we <laughs> we had this magic touch. But still, yeah, I, if I can't sleep at night, I often think about that game. <laughs> it just makes me happy. Yeah, I mean, and, and apart from that one, obviously there's the Premier League, which we've touched on earlier slightly. But how does you how did you feel about that one with when finally bringing the Premier League home after thirty years? 
there's a tiny well there's a couple of bits of regret which is that they couldn't properly celebrate it and the fans weren't in the stadium for the next game you know for the next season and that the next season was a I mean, I'm worried about this season as well, that it doesn't seem like a proper season. Or that, you yeah. know, the following one definitely didn't. But I was just so scared that they were going to cancel it. You know, when, when the whole world stopped and football stopped, you're thinking this isn't this isn't going to happen. I was also... I, so I live near Watford, and so it was Watford we lost to, first of all. You know, we looked like we were going to go unbeaten. We were yeah. just winning everything. And I was pretty scared at that point. Uh, and a lot of people near where I live really enjoyed that result. So it was just getting over the line, and then and then you wanted to win it convincingly, and I think we did that, which is great. But so watching a few games, the season before and that season, to me Van Dyke, I know it's obvious that he's so good, but he just has the ball all the time, and it wasn't until I was at Anfield watching him, just he's so huge, yeah, at just physically and also just controlling the game. So I think the season after, I mean obviously his injury. Had an effect, but it felt to me like that was the main thing. As soon as we lost him, the heart went, and the villain. He was playing in that villain match, wasn't he? I think. But um, yeah, the was, seven, yeah, the seven two. I think it was not long after that. But yeah, I think Pete, rival fans kind of didn't get it when when Van Dyke got injured. How much he actually has an impact, not just defensively, but as an attacking threat with his long passes as well. And I don't think yeah. fans really got that up until, like I said, the season where we didn't have him because that's where we really struggled. And I think that. And as that soon was as he's back. Yeah, and as soon as he came back, we came back. You know, it can't be a coincidence, even though he's not faultless, unfortunately. But I wish he'd score more. I thought he was going to score more at the start. I feel like he, every corner you think he's good, it's going to be him. But um, yeah, he's my oh god, my TV just came on again. Um, yeah, I think out of all the current team, he's the one I want to be friends with. <laughs> well, I've got a few questions at the end for you about ta- uh, Taskmaster Liverpool kind of merging of, of questions but um we've got to we've got to talk about taskmaster obviously it's it's been such a, a huge thing i'm obviously as i said before like i'm a massive fan of probably watched every episode at least Brilliant. two or three times loads and loads of times obviously 12 seasons so there's a lot of seasons there to get through and obviously season 13 is in the pipeline but um can you just tell us where the idea came from and the, the inspiration behind creating the, the game show was yeah sure i mean that's a, not. Uh, well, it's such a weird show because I was going to say it's not often that people say they've watched every episode, but actually, it, it, it is getting quite often because I think during lockdown, a lot of people found it and found it as a bit of a escape, I suppose, because it's such nonsense, um, and it is quite a culty thing. So if you're in, you're in. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was just a stupid idea that. I, so I, so I'm officially a comedian, and I've been to Edinburgh loads of times, and one year I, I didn't go because I was having my first kid. And I was sort of bored at home, and I decided that the following Edinburgh, I'd come back with a a sort of half baked idea. That I'd, I emailed twenty of my mates who were comedians and said, "Look, I'm going to set you a challenge every month. It's going to be called the Taskmaster, and at next Edinburgh, we'll do one night starting at midnight, and I'll explain what happened to the audience." So there were twenty comics. There's people like Rick Edwards did it, actually. He's a Liverpool fan. Yeah, He's not not a comic. There was a weird bunch of people. Uh, <laughs> Joe Wilkinson did it, Tim Key, Mike Wozniak did it. And uh, and the first task was deposit some money in my bank account. Most money wins. And <laughs> Mark Watson put in 200 quid and no one else put in more than a pound or two. So <laughs> so that funded the whole sort of venture. And it was just really fun, obviously. that like, It was so obvious to me doing it that it was a good idea because the comics were really competitive. Like One of them was uh, drink a pint of rainwater, fastest wins. <laughs> And there's a lot of people who just did it, which you really shouldn't do. Just went out to like a water butt they found and drunk it. Other people collected it. Or I remember somebody drove along in a car with their mouth open in a rainstorm. But it was instantly oh, wow. people did different things and it was funny and it was int- and competitive. So we did it up at Edinburgh and then we did it again the following year. But it wasn't meant to be a telly show. But my, my manager said, this, it feels like a telly show. So we pitched it around and everyone said no. And it took three years, I think. And then eventually Dave went for it. Which was good of them because it was quite an odd program because it's the same cast each week and it's unscripted completely. Whereas most panel shows, you know, you know, people know what's going to happen. And at first, Dave said, "You're going to have to tell the comics what the tasks are, otherwise, what if it doesn't work?" But they they went with it and uh, 
yeah, and, and every series we thought this, that's going to be the last one, but they carried on with it. So I, I give Dave quite a lot of credit because it's really difficult making a TV show that works, and it seems to be, to me, completely potluck. But it helps having Greg Davis involved because he's I, – I feel very lucky because I think he's one of the funniest people off the cuff and just physically and being sat next to him. I love it. I, you know, <laughs> I, I love everything about making the show. Yeah, well, that, that segues perfectly into my next question, like about Greg, because like you said, he's just, in terms of you imagining someone else doing it, I, for me, I couldn't because he's he's such a presence, isn't he? Like, obviously, was he six foot eight? And he's obviously used to be a school teacher. He's got that persona. Yeah. He, he's, just, he's just so perfect for that role, isn't he? Yeah, there was never anyone else on the cards. And we knew each other a little bit, but not that well. But And he said yes. He said yes as long as the cast is good, and Frank Skinner said yes as long as Greg's doing it. So we sort of told them both that they were both <laughs> in. Um, but yeah, and he—he's just so natural about it, and he used to—he used to want to see some of the stuff beforehand to make sure he knows what he's going to say, to make sure he knows he had something to say. But now, now he just comes along. I mean, he does lots of work, and he does—he he sort of has the weight of the whole show on his shoulders. He has to run the whole thing, but he's so natural, and yeah. Just that role, it just suits him so well. So he, I think the contestants, they're not scared of him, but they want to impress him. He, he is a bit like Klopp, I promise yeah. you. He's a bit like that thing of everyone wants to play for him and everyone wants him to like him, but he can be cross. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, But he can swear loads, but still mums don't mind and they don't mind their kids watching it. He's, you know, he's got a bit like that Irish thing of swearing as part of his vernacular and it doesn't, it's not offensive. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's 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 definitely. This sounds weird, but he's definitely one of my heroes. Even though he's one of my friends as well, he's just he makes it seem very easy. Hates football yeah. though, absolutely hates football. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think he's just yeah, he's so perfect, isn't he, for 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 that role? And that, so you said there wasn't anyone else in mind for if he didn't fancy it. Did you have no no backups? No, at all? no backup. No backup. No. And also, lots of people say, "Did I not want to do it?" And it's true that they wouldn't have commissioned it if I was in charge because no one, no one knew who I was, and lots of people, thankfully, still don't. But I, I never wanted that role because. That's not me at all. Cause it's actually quite tough judging people because the comics really do their best. And then he has to say, well, you're the worst at that one. Yeah. And I couldn't do that at all. So uh, I'm very happy in my little sidekick role. Yeah, I think it fits, like we said, with that persona, like him being a, a really a big fella. And he, he's got that, like you said, he, people want to impress him like, like Klopp. So the fact that he can say, no, that was shit, that was good. He can say, "Well, yeah, that's fair enough. That I agree yeah. with you." Rather than kind of question it, and I think that's the that kind of dynamic really adds a lot of comedy to it as well, doesn't it? Yeah, and he does it with a twinkle in his eye, even though he take he does take it seriously because people have a go at him online if he if they think he's got it wrong, which they always do. But yeah, he's got a twinkle in his eye, and and everyone knows as soon as it's over. Even though people do get cross in studio, as soon as it's over, it's you know we have a beer. <laughs> we, I've never I've not lost any friends, but I have looked over. Every single contestant at one point, they've all looked at me going, what, what is he doing? You promised me. <laughs> you promised me it would be fair. But, um, yeah. I've heard a rumour, by the way, that because yeah. Greg is six foot eight, so Crouch is officially six foot seven. But I heard a rumour he's, he's actually six foot nine, but he didn't tell anyone that because he said that was too freakish. So he's always, right. he's always lied and said he's six foot seven. But um, they're a very different body shape. Yeah, I, I... I think I think Greg got a more of a he's more of a Bailey man, isn't he? Than Crouch. Obviously Crouch is more of a more of a beam pole, isn't he, than than uh, than Greg is. Yeah, well Greg's dad was a rugby player and uh, wanted Greg to be playing rugby for Wales. So actually drove over the border. I think this is true, to have so his mum gave birth to him in Wales so he could play rugby for Wales, but it turns out he hates hates all sport. <laughs> have you have you got like a favourite a favorite moment i mean that's probably so such a hard question a favorite greg moment from 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 all the seasons uh no that's I, you know what i don't think anyone's ever asked me that because they always say what's your favorite task or something like that so favorite greg moment i do like it when he loses it you know when he when he gets <laughs> when he laughs uncontrollably but i think i'm i tell you what my what i remember most is in the james a caster series i i forget the numbers maybe eight or something like that. But anyway, yeah, in the James Acaster series, 
Greg was trying to open a box. Greg couldn't open the box. Yeah. James said, just open it, you pussy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and because it is all unscripted, it's there was such an atmosphere in the room because no one had ever said anything like that to Greg before. <laughs> so Greg took him to one side at the front of the stage and it was sort of out of the lights. You couldn't really see him. So, you know, the director had to just go with it. And that felt like what the show should be, that people just are reacting and, uh, and in the moment. And Greg reveled in that and James became a little boy. So, yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I was thinking that as one of mine because, like you said, the, the whole throwing of the box and smashing it up and then taking James to the side like he's... And it, like you said, the school, the school like as in being a, an ex-school teacher, that kind of fed into that because it's like, what are you doing? You're better than this and whatever. You don't need to stoop yeah. to those levels. And that was just, it's the little things like that where that 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 comedy, it's only, I guess only Greg can do that because that's the kind of, he's got that type of persona, hasn't he, I suppose? Yeah, and I think then you get to see two comics because James Acast is one of the best comics of our generation. I think that's what, you know, I think he is and he's got that reputation. And Greg, too, of the sort of year, year or two above. So then you see two really brilliant comics in a little situation that has occurred naturally. It would never happen again. It wasn't scripted. So you just it's just a sort of joy to be in their sphere, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, in terms of, like, obviously, you said starting up and stuff and getting Frank Skidder involved, but how, how big was getting Frank involved, do you think, in terms of, obviously... Yeah, then I'd like Joe Wilkinson and John Richardson the second season. Do you think that kind of paved the way to kind of show everyone that it was like a, a show that you want to come on and be a part of? Yeah, I, I, by the way, I feel quite self conscious anyway, any, always talking about Taskmaster as if it's some important thing because it's just a stupid program. But on a, no, so, on a, Alex, so, it's a very important for a lot of people, <laughs> trust me, trust me. <laughs> okay, well, apologize, apologize if I sound uh, <laughs> pretentious at all, but yeah, Frank signing up really gave it that stamp of authority that Frank's done it, so it must be half decent. And Romesh did it that first year, but that was before he's on, on every programme. So we got lucky that first year. <laughs> Romesh and, you know, Josh was still on the way up, I suppose. Roshi and Connerty, people didn't know quite as well. And Tim's my mate. And, uh, and he's, you know, they've all... We've, we've hit the hit gold quite often that people seem to... Hopefully it's a bit of a two-way thing that they do our show, which helps their profile... But also, we just managed to catch a lot of people as they were hitting the big time. So I don't think we'd get Romish now, for example, because the bigger people are, the busier they are. So, you know, we wanted John Bishop, for example, or Mickey Flanagan. But they're these people, it's quite a time commitment to do Taskmaster. It's not just turn up at the studio. You know, it's a you sort of have to commit for a few months here and there. So, yeah, uh, yeah we've, got, we've got lucky over the years. Yeah, because I was going to ask you, like, in terms of, like, selecting them, do you have, like, an active part in that? Or is that kind of, how does it work in terms of, fa- obviously, like you said, it's, it's quite a big part of someone's life to kind of put, to, um, dedicate to the, to the show. So, yeah. is there anyone that you've tried to get and it hasn't kind of worked out? or uh, like Every time anyone asks me that, uh, Jack D is the name I say, because I think Jack D would be brilliant, because I, I don't know if you ever watched Celebrity Big Brother, but he was in the first series and yeah. he tried to escape by digging a hole with a spoon. <laughs> and for me, that's very Taskmaster. And I think I'd like to see that brain in the show. But he's just, uh, what I'm hoping, so the reason Lee Mack did it is that his kids watch it and really like it. So his kids forced him to do it. So I'm hoping that happens with Jack as well. But yeah, it's partly me, partly Greg, partly the production company and partly the channel. We all say who we want. And the, the only rule is we can't have anyone who is who <laughs> is a dick basically, because you've got to really want, it's quite a nice program in that it could be derailed if someone didn't, it's a team, team program, really. If there was one big ego, it wouldn't work. So we, we, comedy is quite a small industry and everyone knows each other. So I, I tend to know, I tend to have met most people on the circuit and, and actually most people are really nice as well. So we go on my instincts and Greg's instincts and then the channel, we, we try to balance it as well, you know, mix of ages and genders and so on. But it's sort of, um, it's getting easier to book people, but equally we're, we're not running out, but we're running out of the household names at, at some point we will, you know, but there's still plenty of people. Up. I know the people in the next couple of series and it's very exciting, but I'm occasionally lose sleep by thinking, what if we run out? What if we run out of comics? What happens? What happens then? But there's so <laughs> many people I'd love to see do it. 
you know, and there's people like Carl Pink- Pilkington or Ricky Gervais oh, or, God, or yeah. Stephen Merchant, out those, that little trio, every single one of them would be great. I mean, there's a million people and there's people from America and yeah, hopefully we'll keep going. Yeah, I think a big, me being a big Ricky Gervais fan, that any of those three, I mean, I think Carl Pilkington might be a struggle because he's kind of just, he likes to do like little things then fall off the face of the earth and then yeah. so getting hold. But Ricky Gervais or Steve Merchant, that would be amazing. And obviously, the new one's got, it's got Chris Ramsey on, hasn't it, that's season 13. So he's a very funny guy as well. So I think, like I said, that you, I don't think you'll struggle, but I think trying to get, maybe get the bigger names might, to kind of commit I suppose yeah. that is, that's the biggest thing, isn't it? It is. I mean, I think we've got we're quite lucky that we can introduce audience to new people. So each time there's one or two people you haven't heard of, probably, and I think that's really good because we know them and they deserve a bigger stage quite often. And you get to see them for ten whole weeks, so by the end you know them. And whether or not you like them, uh, yeah, I always think you come for someone like Lee Mack, and you go away having got to know Mike Wozniak or someone like that. You know, it's it's a good way of getting new people on the on the box. So it's nice to sort of be a gatekeeper of that in some small way. Yeah, I think that was literally my experience of that season. It was Lee Mack, and then I kind of, after episode three, it was like Mike Wozniak is is absolutely hilarious and is a legend, and I love him, and I feel like yeah. I know him. <laughs> yeah, I know. But then I don't know what other programme he can show off being Mike Wozniak, because it's a really unique <laughs> thing he does. I really <laughs> hope he's, he should be huge, but I don't know what programme he's going to be on next, but we'll see. The, the only thing that I kind of was a bit disgusted by was was the fart fart moment where he ma- <laughs> what was it? it? it was he tried to fart, fart all yeah. day with it. Was the task or something something like well, that? Was, wasn't it? It was. We only gave it to him in the end. It was as a sort of trick. We sometimes yeah. do it. So fast, fastest wins, and uh, he really tried his best. It took four or five hours, I think, and then ended up with a hemorrhoid coming out. <laughs> yeah, it was disgusting, and I think we really didn't know whether <laughs> it's appropriate to show on telly, but. <laughs> It got the biggest reaction anything I've ever done has has got. Oh, it was awful. <laughs> it was awful. And in the room, because we didn't know he'd had a hemorrhoid. We knew he'd managed to fart, but we c- could not believe it. Anyway. Oh, so do you know, God. so Wolves Wolves have done their own version of Taskmaster. It's on YouTube. So, so I know a few football people watch it. But yeah, the Wolves version of it is hilarious because they take it very seriously and it's quite deadpan. Um, but yeah. Liverpool, I would love any Liverpool players to do it. I've done it. I've done a version of it on um, Soccer AM. So Jimmy Bullard did a did a task, and that was great. Jimmy Bullard would be a great contestant. Yeah, yeah. I think anyone like that who's a who's a big character who would, like you said, is has got that comedy and also is is competitive. I think that's the that's the two things you need, really, isn't it, to kind of make the show what it is. And that's, I think that's why it's it's done so well, really. Yeah, it obviously helps to be reasonably quick-witted but actually yeah. you know i i watch a lot of the inside anfield youtube stuff because i think it's brilliant and they all come across as being pretty sharp i think robertson would be i think i think i don't i don't think he would uh, i don't know what he would make of it but i think he would be a, a handful for greg to deal with <laughs> i think it'd be lively so yeah it'd be it'd be fascinating yeah, I think Robbo would be the one that uh, Robbo and if if Trent was on there, but then I think Trent would need to be with Robbo. I think because yeah. they're kind of they come as a duo, don't they? I think so. That'd yeah. be funny to see. Yeah, you, you'd <laughs> always want a goalkeeper in there though as well because they uh, So I've met David James a few times as an ex Liverpool goalie. And they are they are different, obviously a different breed. But I don't feel I know Alison well enough to see what he would do. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he'd be. I'm sure it'd be a laugh. I mean, especially after the West Brom header, and he was just yeah, what, yeah. He's, he's now the saviour of, of of the team. <laughs> that, I mean, that goes down as one of the great moments of recent years. You know, and that if he ha- did it, did it turn out that what goal was crucial for the Champions League? Maybe not, but yeah, it did. I think yeah. we, we won that game, and that was kind of one of the building blocks to kind of get get top three, which we ended up getting madly. Yeah. Well, okay, so we'll have Allison Robertson. We'll put Trent in there to be on Robertson's team and Van Dijk and Klopp, I reckon. That's your five. <laughs> that would be that would be a dream come true, I think. <laughs> to watch those to watch those on there to compete with uh to, so what, see what Greg made of them more than anything. Yeah. What... But if Channel Four commissioned that as a full series, only Liverpool fans I don't know who would watch that. It'd be so <laughs> such a weird decision. It'd be so funny. 
<laughs> just no no explanation. Just say this is the next cast. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> But obviously, there's there's twelve seasons of Taskmaster. There's a, there's a lot of guests there, so there's 60, 60 guests. Obviously, not including the special episodes. But I'm sure you've been asked this one as well. But have you got a, a favourite? Obviously, we've mentioned um, James A. Caster, and obviously we haven't t- talked about Bob Mortimer yet. And there's there's some absolutely comedic geniuses there, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I do change. I don't really have a favourite because I, I first of all, I'm very grateful to anyone who's done it. But Bob is definitely the one I was most excited about and he really didn't let me down. He was just being in the same room as him pissing about being Bob was brilliant. And the fact he won it and then came back for the champions was, was great. That was a real, yeah. The best bit, Mick, is when you're having lunch, We it's not a big team. So pre COVID, we'd all just sit around having lunch. It tended to be that someone would go to Sainsbury's and get a spread. It was like Christmas, a Christmas buffet, you know, just get a load of stuff, cheese and ham and bread. And we'd all sit around eating and chatting and just that was my favorite bit. So Bob, but each time, if I think back, I I, I really loved having Joe Brown on it. I, I I loved watching her. I didn't know what she would do, but I thought she was brilliant. And again, a real sort of comedy legend. Uh, I don't really want to single people out actually. And also when I have a friend on it, like Tim Key or Mark Watson, that's really funny for me. Because it's your mate, but I'm sort of in charge of them, sort of not. <laughs> So it's very rare that I so I, was, I did a day-to-day filming with someone who I can't say who, unfortunately. But I look forward to it every day and driving in because I know I know what the tasks are. They don't. But I'm so excited every time they open the envelope and see what they do. So, uh, yeah, don't really have a favourite except Bob Mortimer is the one. If I, had yeah. to pick, if I had to pick anyone, he's the one I'm most glad did it, I suppose. Yeah, and I, I think the task that stands out for me on his is the is the singing task where they had to make make a song. Yeah, that was just when obviously the task was laid out. I was kind of think this is either going to be really really shit or yeah. amazing, and it was the latter. And I was really like surprised. And I think Mark, obviously, like you said Mark's a good friend of yours, and that song with Mark and and Nish was just yeah. like. Just amazing, wasn't it? Well, actually, and Mark and Nish, they wrote that from scratch in 20 minutes. I didn't know Nish could play guitar or sing. I knew Mark could sort of play drums. But Bob, because Bob makes music weirdly. He, he he does tinker around. So he had sort of some unused tracks on his laptop. And that, that one was an amalgamation of some things he'd been mucking around with. But again, they wrote it in 20 minutes. But the funniest thing for me on, on that one, so Rosalind, this, this stranger is in the room. The three people walk in. So it's... Bob and Ashling and Sally Phillips. And the first thing Bob said was, just looked at her and said, do we strike you? <laughs> that was the first thing he said. And it's such a Bob thing. If another person said that, I don't think it would be funny. It would be threatening or something. But if Bob says it, and the, the whole sort of chorus of that song is, Bob, Rosalind is a fucking nightmare. And again, because it's Bob, it's not offensive. <laughs> and Rosalind didn't mind and my parents don't mind. And people sing that song at me quite often. It's really catchy, but um, yeah, it's, yeah. It, I, I mean, I think that the whole song is hilarious. But I think uh, during their recording, it was like really windy as well, and you're kind of running around like yeah. picking up pieces of the set, and that just kind of added to the anarchy of the whole thing. And it was just yeah. And Rosalind sat there in a deck chair, the only person watching. <laughs> it's pretty odd. It's pretty odd if you try to explain to someone why <laughs> why it happened, but. uh yeah, yeah. I think that actually that task probably changed things a bit. From that point on, we've always tried to have one big sort of performance, sort of memorable piece like that. And more often than not, the comics do something good. I sort of forget they are quite talented <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> they're they're often idiots, but um, yeah, it's great when they do the odd good thing. I, I guess in the first series, R- Ramesh is Ramesh did this thing, Tree Wizard, where he did the thing backwards, and that that, that became quite sort of virally, and you know. It's nice when things like that happen. Yeah, I, I recently rewatched that season because I kind of it'd been a while, and I watched it. And I was like, "This is like Ramesh doing Tree Wizard like backwards." That was just that was just absolutely hilarious. But it's uh, weird watching back because it's only six years ago, but it feels like decades ago, and it looks pretty dated. I think there's no, there's not much, there's not many props. It's all pretty bleak. And we filmed it, it live in a theater, then not in a TV studio. We filmed it in something called the Clapham Grand, which is an old nightclub. And so it was a bit rougher, and it was all yeah, it was rough, rough around the edges, I suppose. 
Yeah, I think when you've obviously when you've got that far into it, so you've got these twelve seasons in, and then you go back to season one like I did. That was kind of like it's you can see the progression. I think that's a nice thing to see as well. Obviously, you could the tasks are kind of set out in a in, in a more I don't know comedic way, and you, you know what the setup is. Whereas yeah. in the first season, I suppose you kind of testing stuff out but you've got the people on there to kind of make it funny anyway yeah but you, i sort of miss the old days because they didn't know what was happening at all no one knew what the show was and and you could do sort of bigger tar- you didn't nowadays we have to put lots of clauses in the tasks because they're too canny so if they if you say stand behind the line they will move the line unless you put yeah. another line in saying you can't move the line so i sort of miss the innocence of the old days but equally we quite often have comics on who've never seen it because comics are lazy and the last thing they want to do is watch more comedy so um <laughs> There's still plenty of people that you can trick. We either have people on who've seen every second of it or nothing at all. But um, I should mention Russell Howard as well, because he's, as a Liverpool fan, he, he he's the one person who's brought Liverpool into it because we went to a game. I think that's put the most surprising thing in a chocolate chocolate egg, was it? Yeah, and he put so. in, he put in tickets to Liverpool match. So <laughs> I, took, I took my son to Liverpool Tottenham and it was a classic from a couple of years ago when Kane... Managed to win them a last second penalty, and uh, oh god, yeah, yeah. But it was a classic. It had Mo Salah's goal the other end, uh, which was goal of the season, I think. So, and that was my son's second game live. So it was it was brilliant. But but we went home. I think we felt robbed, even though it was a classic. But yeah, so thanks to Russell for that. <laughs> but uh, in in terms of obviously, there's the tasks that kind of go ahead and the kind of don't work out and I think one of them may- maybe was the Jessica Nappett one where she pretends to fall over and then proceeds to fall over yeah uh, that that one for me that is just if I could show maybe someone one clip from Taskmaster it might wow. be that one just because it, it was just hilarious it was a horrible moment in the room because <laughs> she had to walk down this runway it was just you had to walk down and press a button in exactly I can't remember even what it is exactly 10 seconds I think yeah, yeah, but there was a, point, a bonus point for the best walk or something. It was really wide. It's like three meters wide. And we had a conversation before saying, do we need to put safety rails up? I said, no, it's just walking. Surely no one's going to fall <laughs> off. Yeah, and she pretended to fall and then fell. And we thought, that is a broken leg. It's got to be a broken leg. And I think she was in a lot of pain. And she did herself. She did very well to carry on. But we do two shows a night as well for five days. So it's full on. But she, yeah, thank God, survived. And it is funny. It's funny when someone falls over. I think my favourite TV program is still "You've Been Framed" because I don't think you can beat it. Just seeing people, people fall over. over. It's the best. <laughs> and I think so that the runway that they they walked on that also got re- renamed the Napper after that as well. So you're, you're is... a proper fan, Mick. Not not many people know. There's a little sign on it. You're right when it says the Napper, and we do refer to it as the Napper. And I, I often wonder, why people must wonder what we're on about but yeah it's sort of got its own folklore a bit and which is nice yeah she's yeah i love jessica so yeah she's 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 gone down in taskmaster history yeah she was potentially one of my favorites actually because oh, obviously good. like you said there's, sometimes there's people that you don't really know and i think she was one of them for me that was kind of like you're going into it completely blind and then you realize after three or four episodes like the same with mike wozniak where you kind of like this person is like was destined to come on Taskmaster because they're kind yeah. of such a good fit for it. Yeah, completely. I mean, I'm so we're we're actually filming series fourteen at the moment. So I've had, uh, and plus we've done the two New Year specials. So I've got to know eighty people really well doing it because I'm in their pocket. You know, they're next to them the whole time, and it is a real privilege. But each time I think, right, you're now my best friend. And like with Jessica, we got on really well. And I think, oh, we're going to meet up loads, but you never do because, <laughs> and partly because of COVID as well. But it's just, it's a weird combination because it is work, but it doesn't feel like work. But I do, I do feel I've got to know all those people pretty intimately. But um, yeah, one day I'd love to have a big reunion with all of them there. But we, we do tend to have a big rap party and they all feel like they've been through an odd thing. A bit, a bit like the old days of Big Brother, I suppose, that they've all been, they think of it as the year they were in and so on. And It's quite a good bonding experience. And it doesn't really matter if you win. I think I... I think it's better if you come last. To be honest, they're the ones you really remember. the The people who yeah. are dreadful tend to make more <laughs> of an impression. Yeah, I think uh, I think it was the Cineman. I think he was just one of them. That was yeah. It was like a running joke that Greg would be like, 
yeah, Paul's Paul's last, and I think that's kind of, that kind of adds to the comedy, doesn't it, as well? Yeah, bit. you can be, you can, yeah, you can win a lot of friends. No one likes winners, and you learn that as a <laughs> Liverpool fan in the eighties, or a Man U fan in the nineties. No one likes the people in the top of the league, really. You know, it's fun to be there yourself, but yeah, it's a, it's the underdogs that you really root for. Yeah, <laughs> but I th- in the the most recent season, obviously that's been heard. Season twelve, you got. I don't know if I'm, I think I'm right that it was the first time that you kind of were actively involved in a task where you had to, you had to score a goal. Yeah, did, that's true. Did, yeah. did you enjoy Did you enjoy actually, did you enjoy loved that one? It. Yeah, of course. <laughs> absolutely loved it. Because I'm, I think of myself as being, when I was a kid, I was all right at football. You know, I played a lot. And I've played Monday night football with dads now, you know, like we all do. And, uh, and I love it. And I don't get to do it enough because it's, it's busy time and COVID again. So, yeah, the chance to do football, football on the telly. And I scored a really good goal against Govs. <laughs> so, so they might, I don't know if it was... I, well, I sort of said, please show a couple of replays of that. And it's mainly so my kids could see it. But it turned out Alan Davis is a good keeper. He, he kept the ball out for ages. But, yeah, it was fun having a football task. And it was fun... I mean, that's... The whole thing is, it's like being kids, you know, when you're at work. All I got to do was play football and people film it. So, yeah, no, I love that one. But we did, there was another football one in oh, the, the series with Ian Sterling, which was quite a good one, where they had to score a goal from the furthest distance away. Oh, I loved it. But they had yeah. to pick the distance. <laughs> so it's such a boys thing where the boys all put it way back. It was That was Paul Sinner, wasn't it, as well? And, uh, yeah. and Joe Thomas. And they all thought, oh, we can score from miles away, particularly Ian Sterling. And he actually found a bigger goalpost in some field nearby and still missed, whereas the girls just put it right in front of it. The girls are always more clever. Yeah, that was, that was, I mean, because sport, I mean, I always think golf is kind of a task. Get, you know, get this ball into that hole and as few shots as possible. So I think, you know, sports definitely got, has a bearing on coming up with the tasks. I think, I think we like, as humans, pissing about you know if you're if you're bored and you're trying to chuck a stone at a tin can or a piece of paper into a bin that's basically what the tasks are yeah i think like you said the ian stale and one where you said he pulls out that massive goal and then goes really far back and you're like well he's just going to tap that in and then he misses he was gutted you, you can't script that and i think like you said the sport what i think was it was it rod gilbert who it was get the ball into this hole so he just he dug up the hole and moved yeah, it yeah that was that was really satisfying, that one, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's the sort of person, if he was in a football match, he would, before the game, find all the rules and find some little sub which says, actually, it doesn't say you can't pop the ball. You know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah, it's it's nice when they, you take a sport like golf and then taskmaster it up, I suppose. Yeah, digging up the hole. We had a good conversation about what is a hole because we looked on the spade and we couldn't see a hole. I thought he'd left the <laughs> hole behind. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, there's there's been so many, and I, I could talk to you all night about Taskmaster, but we're, we're we're getting a bit late in the night here, so I'll I'll also move think on. we might be boring the people who don't like Taskmaster quite intensely. Definitely not. If if the I mean if they want to turn off, they don't like Taskmaster, that's fine. But if you do, then I'm sure you will enjoy talking about hearing you speak about what what's 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 been. Oh uh, well, I can speak for it for hours as well. One day, one day, Mick, we'll have a drink. Oh yeah, definitely. That well, let's. Get Greg involved as well, and we'll yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a legend he is! What a legend. But before I let you go, Alex, just thought I'd combine. A f- I mean, we've probably answered maybe a couple of these, but I'll just combine Taskmaster and Liverpool together, and which Liverpool, which current Liverpool stars you think would do best? Obviously, you mentioned Robbo, you mentioned yeah, Van Dyke as well. Else. Why not? Um, well, I like to think that Firmino. So his back heel at the weekend is typical. He's just so cheeky. I think he would do it with, with the most flair, I think. So I'd like to see him have a go. I'd like to see him in the kitchen with one of the food tasks and just see what he does. <laughs> I just think he's got such a winning smile. So I'll have Bobby. I really like him as well, and I, I want him to find his proper form again. So I'll have I'll have him, please. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good show, actually, because I think he's got that, like you said, the... the um... Like the the skill to to kind of maybe do do a rod Gilbert and go this is this is in the hole the hole's going to be right next yeah. to me but I'm going to back heel it in rather than I, yeah 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 
<laughs> he does unnecessary. When he went through that phase of the no look goals, which he seems to have stopped now, it's so stupid. It's such a <laughs> pointless thing to do. And it was always, I don't think he ever came on stuck with it, but um, that sort of thing is great. Just the extra bonus content. And he also looks pretty relaxed. He never seems to get too head up about it. I think Mo, I'm not sure Mo would be into it. I don't think he'd have time for it. But I can see Firmino thinking, yeah, I'll do this for a laugh. Yeah, I, th- I think Mo would kind of be too so driven on winning. <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't uh, be would, popular, would, would he? It would ruin any comedy that would be available because he'd... <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't mind a team task where it's Mo, Salah and, you know... Lisa Tarbuck or something like that, where, where he just has to put up. Yeah. Oh God, that, that what would task that would be? Lisa Tarbuck and Mo Salah throwing. I just have this image of what what was that task where you had to throw, get the snow off the side of that kind of. I don't know what it was. It was like the centre of a park, and you had to throw uh, obstacles to get the snow off the thing. Was it something like that? It was something like that. I mean, that rings a bell. I don't know why I can't remember. Was that? A, a, oh, I don't know. Yeah, probably. <laughs> God, God, it sometimes scares me. Yeah, I can't remember everything. But um, yeah, no, yeah, Mo would be too good as well. I think he'd win everything. That would be the problem. Yeah, you don't want someone who's going to win every task. I bet he's good at art. Yeah, I think he's. He'd just be one of them people that is like, well, we don't want him part of the team because he's. Yeah. He's taking it too seriously, and that's not what it's about. It's about, like you said, being the best loser. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in terms of like Liverpool, for any former Liverpool player, then obviously you've, you've touched on, you've met like John Barnes and Peter Crouch, and who do you, do you think those type of people would, would do best on it? Crouch would be great. He's really competitive. When we did stuff on that on the Euro show, we we had to do these things where you score volleys and stuff, and I had, I got to have a go, and it's really fun. But you realise how good, how good these people are. So he, but he really went for it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he didn't want. He was, he's very up for looking like an, an idiot. But when it came to volleys and headers, he wanted to be the best. So I think he'd be great on it. He's obviously got a great sense of humour. Uh, who else? Oh, it's probably Ruddock. I think because we, you know, we've seen him. He's quite TV savvy. Yeah, I, I'd, I wouldn't mind him having a go. I don't think I'd want Mark Lawrence to do it particularly. I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> Would you not I'm be not worried sure. about Razor just turning up one day like naked? He likes to do that these days, doesn't he? Oh, I wouldn't mind that at all. <laughs> we, not, I think there's not been enough nudity in the show for a little while. I think David Baddiel was the last person who kept taking his clothes off. Um, I wouldn't mind Alan Hansen. I, I think people like Alan Hansen are quite serious but are also funny. He'd, he'd be good. I'd, yeah, I'd go with Alan. <laughs> I'd be yeah. worried about being dis- disrespectful with him, but I don't. That's why you've got Greg. That Greg doesn't mind having a go at anyone. Yeah, I think that that's like you said. That brings the comedy in itself, doesn't it? The kind of yeah. Greg's got. He's got no. He's got no boundaries in terms of who he can tell off. So that, that's yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then la- last question. Obviously, I think we've covered it a little bit as well. But Jürgen Klopp, do you think if if you had to have someone to stand in for Greg? It, 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 in terms of anyone from the current the current knit of, of squad, that it would be Klopp, wouldn't it, I suppose? Yeah, I'm not just in the football world, not just in the Liverpool world. I think out, out of all entertainment, it's going to be Klopp. So so I, I've got this band as well called the Horn Section, and uh, the saxophonist in my band is also Robbie Williams's saxophonist. And Jürgen Klopp has turned up at quite a few Robbie Williams gigs. He's a big Robbie Williams fan. And he comes <laughs> right. backstage and... I don't want to do Jürgen a disservice, but he smokes quite a bit. He drinks quite a bit. This is sort of outside of the season. But he just let, you know, he has a laugh and he's he's funny and he mucks in and he, you know, he's everyone's mate and he talks to all the band. And I think he's just my hero. And I, I would have no doubt that he could run Taskmaster uh, effortlessly and would rival Greg. I, th- I can imagine him doing the links into the break. <laughs> And oh, it'd be brilliant, yeah. So, yeah, no doubt, yeah. I think that even was, the name sounds right. a bit like Greg Jurgen and Greg, the Jurgen and Greg show, but then obviously yeah. you have to be there. So, I mean, those maybe Greg on the left, you in the middle, Jurgen on the right, and then they're kind of vying over what the score should be, and you're just yeah. kind of trying to fight, 
or, or just sit there and just accept it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd love it. So I think they they do make the show in different countries, and I think there's there's always chat of a German one, but he's quite un German in our sort of uh, cliche of, you know, the cliche of Germans not having a sense of humour. But there's Henning, Henning Vane, I think, would always be good on Taskmaster. One day I'm sure we'll have him. But he's yeah, Jürgen is that sort of German in me. He's he's so jolly, and actually, you know the fake the fake Jürgen from the from the Euros. Do you see the fake Jürgen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. Um, we did a thing with him recently on the last leg. Yeah, I was. I've never met Jurgen Klopp, but I was just as excited to meet Fate Jurgen because he's such a good <laughs> impressionist. I was still. I took pictures with him and showed him my friends because just being that close to meeting Jurgen Klopp is that. That's my dream. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I've I've missed one. I just thought we'd go back to it. obviously. Sure, of course. Well, fit, I haven't like fit, maybe guessed that you want to get on, and obviously. Sean Locke sadly, sadly died in August of last year. Would he have been someone that you would have loved to see? Because he's got that, like, so the quick wit of the humour, and he, he, I think he would have been, he would have really thrived on a show like Taskmaster. I think he would have been amazing. Yeah, definitely, he's the funniest person. So, you know, doing Cat's Does Countdown and sat next to him. The problem was, you just end up watching him and laughing, yeah. and he, and he's really not. We had so many drinks with him afterwards, and actually, I did ask him, and he said, "No, nah, can we ask for that?" So. <laughs> He's he is someone who he does his own thing and did his own thing and just yeah I would have loved him to do it but I was glad that I had asked and he said no and then we had a nice drink so that was you know at least it nice at least trust. yeah at least I wasn't wondering but yeah the funniest you know real honour to have not just been on a program with him just you know been hopefully more than an acquaintance I suppose yeah yeah. Yeah, definitely. But uh, Alex, I think we'll leave it there because we've, we've just surpassed an hour. But I just wanted to say thanks very much for for jumping on. It's been, like I said, it's been a real pleasure for me to to have you on and to, to chat about to chat about Taskmaster and, and your and your Liverpool connection. So it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Oh, pleasure for me too. This is much bigger than Desert Island Discs. This is it. This is the trouble. <laughs> is the trouble is I can be so boring about Taskmaster and so boring about Liverpool. So you know. If you're not a fan of Liverpool or Taskmaster, this is real sleep fodder. This is what you've got to put on when you're trying to get to sleep at night. Well, no, I've well, really enjoyed it, Mick. Thank you. We are a dedicated LFC channel, so I'm hoping that the kind of the, the crossover of, of some people is Taskmaster and Liverpool like it is for me. So I'm sure a lot of people will like it, hopefully. You, you never know. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And if you ever need another Liverpool fan with a Taskmaster connection, let me know. I'll see, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, definitely. Cheers, Alex. But if you if you like the video, please do like it, share and subscribe and, and we will see you soon up the reds.